Hello and welcome everyone to another video of our playthrough of Carrier Command 2. So a couple of caveats. As I mentioned previously in the last video, uh, not all of these videos may have voice commentary and of the ones that do have voice commentary, not all of them may have live commentary. So I'm actually recording this commentary post after I've recorded the video. So basically I'm just watching it and I'm going to commentate on a couple of things. So that's the first caveat. Second caveat is that um, for just technical reasons, I had some technical difficulties, I had to actually restart the campaign, so it basically means it regenerated the entire world. Now I've already gone through the trouble of capturing our first island, previously that was Odrasir in the last video, but on this island that I'm now moving away from, as you can see on the center monitor there, uh, that island is high tech. It's, again, it's a one shield island, and it has fuel on, on it, so it produces fuel, so... Yeah, but anyway, I'm just headed up to the northwest here. Do I think the island is magma? Because I want to uh, do a little test run and try out our surface fire torpedoes from our carrier, and there is an enemy vessel there, as you can see on the center screen, up in the top left there. So there's an enemy vessel there, and I want to get rid of it. So we're we'll check the air-sea radar. There it is. Yep, we are getting closer. That little green line is the bearing of our carrier. And uh, let's arm the torpedoes. And as we change the bearing on how these torpedoes are going to be fired, you can see the red line move. That's the bearing that we're going to fire the torpedoes on. So we just make sure it lines up roughly with our target. That looks good. All right, and uh, we do need to get a bit closer. I do not know the range of these torpedoes. Like I said, the manual is pretty vague in some ways. It tells you, like, you know, oh, you can do this, that, and the other, but how do you do it? Like, what are the range of these weapons? What are the range of these torpedoes? And I know a lot of people have already put videos on YouTube and all that based on, like, uh, you know, oh, we've discovered that the range of this weapon is such and such, you know, so many thousands of meters, I think it is, you know. But anywho, um, I just feel that there's a need to get closer. I'm also arming, I've also armed the, as you can see, the uh, defensive weapons, the Sea Whiz there, and the air-to-air -air missiles, or the surface-to-air missiles, just in case we get jumped, you know, or this, this vessel, whatever it may be, starts firing missiles at us, so. or something like that. Anyway, I'll say, um, that first couple of hours of play, playing this game, I actually got seasick. Uh, so it took me a little bit to get my sea legs. Um, I guess technically, uh, not really seasick. It's in this context, it's simulator sickness, or also called visually induced motion sickness. Regardless, it's a type of motion sickness. Okay, but you know because of the way the 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 rolling and the pitching motion, you know, on the on our on our simulated waves here, it actually made me a bit motion sick if I play this game for a long time. So. I found that I need to look away from the screen fairly frequently just to kind of, you know, reorient myself, right? I also bought some, like, ginger candy that I can eat, um, so I might eat some of those. That being said, I'll try not to eat anything. Uh, like, the only thing I do is, like, drink something, so you may hear me, like, take a sip of water or something, but I try not to eat anything when I do voice commentary. I don't know how many of you have misophonia, but I hate when people like chew or suck or make the mouth noises or whatever. Yeah. What bothers me the most actually in terms of misophonia is just like that, um, the, the kind of lip smacking noises. You know, when people eat their food, like and chew with their mouth open and they're like, Yeah, oh, it drives me absolutely nuts, you know, and anyone who's got misophonia knows, like, oh, you just want to kill that person, yeah, so that's me. So I'll try to, I'll try not to do that, and if I do, then I'll try and edit that noise out, just for the sake of your sanity. <laughs> anyway, we just need to get a little closer here. I guess that's another thing, you know, in relation to that. Um, I guess I like the way that this game models water. You know, on most quote-unquote naval games of some sort, we gotta load our torpedo tubes there, on most naval games, you know, the water is largely just a texture, but here there's an actual physics engine. Fire one. 
Wild tool. All right. Here it's an actual like part of the physics engine, so it feels like you're actually, you know, on the ocean. Not only is the game really immersive, but it, it feels like this ship is moving up and down, pitching and rolling and heaving with the waves. So I, I really like that about the game. It adds to the immersiveness and it it removes that kind of that fake feeling of most other games where you're just kind of like gliding along a glassy, smooth plane, you know? Again, like a la World of Warships. So anyway, so I like that. There's an actual physics engine to the water and it's done pretty well, even though, you know, the waves, some of the swells and the waves in this game are just massive and ginormous. And I've probably darn near rolled this carrier enough to like have like have it capsize on me in real life. But anyway, thought I'd arm those razor bills up with some, uh, some weapons there. Let's take a look at our torpedoes. Again, I wish there was more you could do with this hollow map, apart from just stare at it. It would also be nice to get a positive ID on that. I think we're close enough where we can see it. Oh, yeah, let's see something. I don't know how many torpedoes this is going to take to sink. It may just take one. I think it's a needle. Ooh. And yeah, we literally blew it out of the water. It took flight. <laughs> Yep. And yeah, we only need one. Okay, well, I think that was a Corvette. So, there's that. Alright, well, we know the torpedoes work. So now we just uh, need to get closer, start launching some aircraft. Yep, going from high tech to magma. Liquid hot magma. Get some uh, airborne recon up in the air and uh, see what we can see. Okay, well, we don't really need torpedoes on that since we took care of the surface threats. So, let's see, what else can we put on this Razor Bill? Thankfully, uh, the game has received a couple of hot fixes and updates and patches, so the Razor Bills can actually make attacks now. They're not very good with their guns, so it's best to put, like, missiles and bombs and, you know, some bigger ordnance on there. So, let's try bombs. Let's see how well they do with bombs. We have a new transmission. Commander Gage? I asked UEC Combat Analytics to run Monte Carlo simulations on your campaign against ACC Omega. Given all the data we have available, we have some key statistical outcomes that may influence your tactical decision making. First, in 73% of simulation runs, ACC Epsilon would face material shortages, ammunition, fuel, drone craft. So you really need to keep an eye on your localized supply chain. Second, in 32% of simulations, the ACC Omega recaptured an island that had been previously secured by Epsilon. So don't forget to stay vigilant. Third, 23% of the time, insufficient focus on repair systems would result in loss of operational capability at inopportune times. While automated balanced repairs are convenient, for maximum efficiency, you may need to take a direct hand. Finally, and... I don't wish to alarm you, but the overall chance of success they calculated is only 13%. Best of luck, Commander. <laughs> well, gee, that's a very, uh, um, that report they gave me doesn't inspire a terrible amount of confidence. We have an airfield down there. We want to take it out. Just a gun. See if we can fire. No, we are out of range, and Amanta is getting ready to take off. That okay? We need to get rid of this fast, pronto, rapido. Anyway, um, yeah, like the, the transmission said, uh, whatever his name was, yeah, he, he said you know he was having them combat analytics run some uh, Monte Carlo simulations. That's just a fancy way of saying they were wargaming things out using 
Monte Carlo basically means probabilistic mathematical models. So that's a fancy way of saying like uh, random number generation or dice rolls or whatever, right? So they're, they're, they're using combat models based on dice rolls to kind of project certain things, you know, what are my odds of success? And as you can see, or as you heard, they're not terribly great. So that is, uh, that's not ideal, but you know, they underestimate my awesomeness. Otherwise they wouldn't have sent me down here because I'm the Grand High Idiot of the fleet. Yep, that's my official title, Grand High Idiot Moron, Captain Moron here. Actually, if any of you have seen that movie, Captain Ron with Kurt Russell. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, what's his name? Martin Short. He calls him Captain Moron. Anyway. So, there's that. Yeah. We, uh-oh. We are having some trouble here. Get back to the boat. You two, Razorville. You are going to get shot down. Oh, dang it, we just lost it. Ah, uh, no, that's... That's alright, that's what happens. Yeah, that happens. We're gonna lose aircraft. You just land. Maybe we can drag him back to the, uh... Into our air defense. Take care of him there. Yep, there goes our... There goes our albatross, and there he is. And our... Oh, our... Surface air missiles are tracking. They were. <laughs> yeah, I do think some of the alarms in this game could be a little bit more louder. Like I said, they also need to be more distinct, like different ones for different scenarios. Because any kind of like oral, not oral as in like mouth, but like A U R A L. Oral, as in auditory. Any auditory warning, usually, you know, aboard a ship, the different bells and alarms and whistles and all that, they're distinct. So they can be instantaneously differentiated from, you know, such and such. So, I think, like, you know, the, the different alarms, the different noises you hear, they need to be more distinct, I think. Especially on the bridge, right? So there's that. But yeah, I don't know uh, on what... Oh, and it looks like an enemy albatross just got airborne too. Yeah, I don't know what range the enemy will detect you and start, like, say, launching aircraft or whatever. What was that? Oh, I see. Yeah, we fired some... Fired some uh, main gun rounds at it. Shells. Oh, yeah, and also, speaking of the main gun, you know, I mentioned they fire, like, 160 millimeter shells in this game. Which seems kind of weird or whatever. You know, it, it, it definitely is kind of a strange caliber. Why 6.3 inches? Yeah, of all things. You know, and of course, it's it's modeled on a 57 millimeter gun. It doesn't actually fire that, but anyway, yeah. Um, but that being said, you know, uh, even though it is kind of an odd caliber. Okay, let's see if we can take one of these out. Even though it is kind of an odd caliber, um, having larger guns like that on a on an aircraft carrier is not unheard of, historically anyway. Uh, of course, carriers, for example, those that were converted from battle cruisers like the Lexington and the Saratoga and our Razor Bill has done a face plant right onto the deck. But not to worry, it can take back off once it like self-rights or whatever, but yeah. Anyway, as I was saying, um, you know, ships that were converted from battle cruisers like the Lexington, the Saratoga, or the Akagi and the Kaga, um, those did have uh, somewhat larger guns, like 8-inch or 7.9-inch guns, respectively. And the reason for that, from my understanding anyway, is that it goes back to their original role as battle cruisers. And the reason why they kept them on, even though they were carriers, even after their conversion to aircraft carriers, the reason why they kept those guns on them is because the original intended role for aircraft carriers in those interwar years, right, when the Navy was doing like all, all types of different fleet problems and games and things like that, is that aircraft carriers were originally envisioned as scouts for the battle line, for the battleships, right? 
So it wasn't, they didn't anticipate that CARES would play such a massive role that they would in World War II. So they're like, okay, well, you know, we may as well stick some larger guns, eight inch guns on these carriers, because uh, if they're gonna be scouts and they might need to fight off like destroyers and cruisers if they get into a gunfight. Of course, history shows us that that is a very stupid idea to take a carrier into a gunfight. And of course, you know, they never really had much use for those large guns anyway, so there's no point in putting, you know, anything larger than like a three inch or a five inch gun on a carrier. It's not a surface combatant. It relies on its aircraft to project its combat power. So effectively, it's like an offense is the best defense. You know, you're better off finding the enemy ships or the aircraft or the enemy platforms and shooting them down or sinking them before they have a chance to launch any kind of weapon at you, like a torpedo or an anti-ship missile or whatever. So. See if we can get this this albatross. Those missiles though. Have another one. Have some. Oops, see what's been getting. Oh yep, we got it. Okay, so. Anyway, yeah, um, the idea of having larger guns, like larger than like five inches aboard a carrier, is not unheard of, although it's not terribly useful, historically anyway, and in real life, but again, it's a science fiction game. <laughs> I guess another thing, in line with that, there's no shortage of like loony ideas of people trying to design like weird carrier battleship hybrids like ooh, let's stick big guns like even larger guns like that on a carrier or let's take this battleship and like convert like half of it into a carrier it's, yeah and you know most of these kinds of ideas never thankfully never went beyond the design phase or the drawing board but some actually did and they didn't do terribly well so yeah it's <laughs> anyway case in point having a battleship with a flight deck with a large flight deck for like aircraft or having a carrier with really big guns on it either way it doesn't work out it never has you know it's better to just really specialize in something so yeah every time we've tried it it doesn't work out well but luckily for us this uh this gun certainly does quite a bit of damage and it works fire on some nice, big, juicy clumps of targets. Boom! Rain some high explosive death and destruction down on that. Alright. Very good. Very nice. Let's get another aircraft airborne and uh, actually scout out this island. I think we've eliminated most of the air threat. I think. I haven't seen anything else launch from that airfield, so I think we're pretty safe. So let's get some aircraft aloft and see if we can uh, do some scouting and uh, capture this island, shall we? Anyway, uh, in light with that, I, I can say that I do have some lingering questions about this game, and most of these questions that I have about this game are related to uh, the game's mechanics and features, which in many ways kind of goes back to the things that I would like to see in the game. So, uh, some of this might be a little bit redundant from the last video, you know, where I talked about things oh, I'd like in the game, and well, these are also related to the questions I have about the game. So. For example, like, why are there no AI crew members in single player mode? Like, why are you the only person aboard this carrier? It's clearly designed for a multi-person crew, for more than one. And I'm not talking about like multiplayer, you know, where me and another person joins up and plays, but you know, just in single player, like you're the only person aboard this ship. Why? It, clearly it would be the most efficient if they had sent down like me and a couple other people 
down to this boat. Yeah. Of course, you know, looking back on it, um, they mentioned at the start of the game, you know, that the, the terrorist Stanza organization has breached the firewalls and they have taken control of the, the other, the Omega carrier or whatever. So I guess this all started because they had bad network security <laughs> and someone hacked into their system and they've taken control of the carrier, of the, the other carrier. So I guess for those reasons, uh, they need to talk with their network administrator and um, yeah figure out how to fix that problem so they sent us down here to do it do it all old school huh this is all happening because they someone hacked in i have seen a video where um people have located the enemy carrier and apparently there's no one aboard it because like they said you know they, the enemy stanza has taken control of the carrier and I guess they're operating it remotely so there's no one physically aboard the enemy carrier so I have seen another video where where people have literally come up to alongside the enemy carrier while it's like shooting at them and they have like one of the one of the players has physically boarded the carrier if you get close enough you can and at the right um, height you know based on the waves and stuff you can essentially walk off the edge of your carrier and fall down onto the deck of the enemy carrier, go up to the bridge of the enemy carrier, and activate the enemy's self-destruct sequence. And that way you, you can win the game, essentially. You know, you can destroy the enemy carrier that way. You don't have to like get into a big gunfight and shoot missiles and torpedoes at it. If you get it in the right if you get your carrier in the right position alongside the enemy carrier, you can literally jump onto the enemy carrier and activate their self-destruct <laughs> sequence. Which is in the floor, I haven't showed it, but um yeah, that's just funny. <laughs> so that's one way to do it. You know, you can, you can scuttle the enemy's own vessel. Anyway, let's take the razor bill and see if these bombs work, huh? So anyway, yeah, I, but like going back to my original um, point, it's like, why are there no... Is there anyone else aboard this carrier? Is this carrier actually designed... Ooh, bombs away. Is this carrier actually designed to be operated by a single person? I mean, it can. That doesn't necessarily mean that it should. Hey, bomb worked. Let's do it again. So yeah, it just makes me wonder. So that would be kind of a, a nice thing. Let's watch this from the perspective of the albatross. Let me see chef explode. We like big explosions, bro. Oh. Well, that definitely did it. Well, it's it's out of ammo. Yeah. <laughs> Let's bring her home. So anyway, yeah. Case in point, why are there no other crew members, even just AI crew members, aboard this boat in single player? And another question I have is, since Wind Direction is actually modeled in the game, is it actually advantageous to, like, follow, like, real world procedure and turn into the wind to launch and recover aircraft now if you turn into the wind and like go like you know flank speed all ahead flank to launch and recover aircraft that actually doesn't do very well for these aircraft they can actually end up like the deck will pitch so much that the aircraft can actually end up like going right into the into a wave or you know or as it's coming into land it can actually you know smack into a wave or smash into the deck or whatever, you know, have a ramp strike or whatever, what have you. So, indeed, I found, like I said in the last video, I found that the best way to facilitate launches and recoveries is to turn into the wind but stop engines rather than increase speed like you would uh, in real life. So I wonder if wind direction really makes much of a difference when you launch and recover aircraft. I suspect it does to, to some degree because you're launching and recovering aircraft, and those things fly through the air. So <laughs> I imagine it would to a degree. So that's another question I I do have with regard to this game. I think you know when I start playing this game and I start looking at a lot of things, I think that's something people misconstrued as a bug. You know they would 
try and launch aircraft in like these massive, when they're in the middle of these huge seas and the boat's going every which way and, and whatnot. And they thought like, oh, this game is bugged. It's like, no, that's, you know, you wouldn't be launching or recovering aircraft in that situation or, you know, you would try to minimize that, that massive amount difference in movement in the deck. So, yeah, no, that's not a bug. <laughs> you need to find a place where the, the waters are relatively calm or make it in such a way so that the deck isn't pitching and heaving and rolling all over the place so you can have a good launch. So people were misconstruing that as like a bug, you know. Like, nope, it's not. You need to be more careful when you launch and recover aircraft. You need to get the carrier into an advantageous position to make that happen. And I think it's just that last, looking at, looking at this, I putting up a flare. I think we literally only have one more enemy walrus on this island. All right, well, let's gun run him. Let's see if we can take it out. Yeah, I think that was the last enemy. So we just have to wait for the, uh, our seals to get in there. Our Navy seals. Ha, 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 ha. Ah, uh, uh, get it? Haha, <laughs> yeah. I think we need to wait for our Navy SEALs to infiltrate. We'll give the go code DELTA. Go to tactical mode. Uh. Shoot it with a gun. That's what the bullets are for, you twit. So I wonder if wind direction has much of, a, of, a, of an effect on launching and recovering aircraft. Also, you know, like I mentioned, why do we need to kind of constantly babysit the aircraft? Like, can they make it so that they RTB under certain circumstances, like Winchester on ammo or bingo fuel or whatever? And why are there no escorts for this carrier? Because the carrier carriers are not self-sustaining. They require protection, you know, destroyers, cruisers, frigates, all that to escort them. They also require like logistics support from like oilers and uh, replenishment vessels and all that. Although, although I mean like, you know, we do have logistics barges in this game. So that's kind of like, you know, underway replenishment, doing an unwrap or whatever. But anyway, just that's another question I have. Why do we have no, no surface combatants for escorts? I don't know. Maybe it would be a bit too much to integrate, to implement into this game as a functionality, right? like you would uh, an actual like carrier strike group or an amphibious ready group or whatever. Maybe we'll just leave that up to uh, the guys at uh, Dry Dock Dream Games who are developing Task Force Admiral because that will actually simulate a whole carrier task force. And why are the carrier's weapons physically modeled on real-world naval weapons? Some of which are like 30 or 40 years old. <laughs> Again, it's just another weird question. It's like, why, if this is a science fiction game, why not just give kind of a generic model for the gun or for the, the missile launchers or for the, the close-in weapon systems? You know, you could still call it a sea whiz. Like, a sea whiz is just a generic term, right? But... It's clearly modeled on like a Mark 15 Phalanx, right? The surface air missiles are clearly rapier missile systems, but why did they have to model these on real world weapons? Couldn't they just have made some kind of generic model? I don't know. <laughs> Again, it's just kind of, it, it, there's this weird kind of cognitive dissonance here is that we have models of actual weapon systems, but they're not. At least they don't really work that way in game necessarily. I don't know. It's, it just seems kind of weird. And like I said before, you know, why is there no other method of illumination other than like flares? Like apparently this Navy has gone through so many budget cuts. We, they can't afford to give us, you know, night vision or thermal infrared or something. I mean, heck, they sent us down here alone to command this, to work this entire carrier. I mean, maybe that's why. They suffered some big budget cuts in this Navy for everything from personnel to uh, 
to uh, fancy stuff, you know? Oh, we can't have night vision. Too expensive. We can't have infrared thermal cameras. Nah, too expensive. We're sending you down there alone. Well, we'll give you a bunch of flares, though. We, we can uh, have uh, parachute flares, yeah. That'll work. Yeah, that's show. show. Yeah. You know, budget cuts. Gotta do some belt tightening. Another question I have is why, like, if we have cruise missiles, uh, why do we not have anti-ship missiles? We have torpedoes, yes, but why no, like, sea-skimming, you know, harpoons or whatever? That just seems kind of weird. And I guess the cruise missiles in-game are TV-guided, or you have to keep, like, the target painted with the scope, with whatever camera you're using to paint the target. You have to keep, you know, your reticle on the target to guide that cruise missile in. So it's not really a cruise missile per se. That just seems kind of strange. Most cruise missiles that I know of anyway, uh, you program in some coordinates or whatever, and you fire the missile and it guides itself automatically towards those coordinates. It's a, I don't know. I, 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 I'm not an expert on these systems, so okay, but like this just, just seems funny that way like or maybe there's no like mode for the, these missiles to act autonomously just seems kind of kind of funny anyway I'm gonna bring that uh that other seal back. We don't really need him because we've gotten rid of everything on this island. So you can just come back to the carrier. Our other one with the virus pots is still on its way to do its do its glorious, honorable duty of capturing this island for us. And perhaps one of the bigger questions I have in relation to this game. Of course, again, just to reiterate, it's a throwback to the 1980s game, but why is this a straight dick carrier? Like, why is there... Why isn't this... Ha why doesn't this have an angled deck? You know, and furthermore, why is there only one aircraft elevator on this thing? Yeah, like, these types of things, like, they really, really slow down air operations. Like, we cannot launch or recover aircraft at the same time. There's only one elevator, so, you know, you know, the elevator needs to get in the proper position. You need to wait, you know, for an aircraft to land. Then you need to, you know, strike it below deck into the hangar before you can bring another one up for it, could, for it to take off. And so it just, it just seems weird. Like, why of all, why of, of all, all design choices is this a straight deck? Why of all design choices did they only give us one aircraft elevator? It just seems kind of strange. It's so like we would have to wait for this albatross that's landing right now to back itself up, go down below deck, get struck below deck, and if we want to launch another aircraft, we need to wait for that to happen. So, yeah, it just slows down aircraft operations. Seems really weird. And furthermore, okay, um, why is the island on the port side? The island is like the, the superstructure above the flight deck, okay? So why is the island on this carrier on the port side, the left side of the ship? Like, this is the, the Akagi, or the Hiryu, you know, the, the Japanese aircraft carriers, Kagi, Akagi or Hiryu. Those were the only aircraft carriers, to my knowledge anyway, that had their islands on the port side. And it wasn't really all that conducive to uh, air operations. Just checking to see uh, how far along we are. And we're getting there. For one thing, there's a variety of reasons. I had to look this up. So there's a variety of reasons why most carriers, or basically all carriers these days, have their islands on the starboard side. And there we go, we captured magma. Large munitions, yay. Bombs and torpedoes, nice. Anyway, there's a lot of reasons why carriers have their islands on the starboard side. As you can see, even on our carrier in this game, the landing pattern is counterclockwise. Anti-clockwise, okay? So... The reason for having the island on the starboard side is that when the landing pattern is counterclockwise, the island creates turbulent air behind it as the ship moves through 
the, the water, right? So aircraft circling into land from the port quarter, from the rear left side of the ship, the, they don't have to contend with that disrupted airflow if the island is on the starboard side. Now, if on the port side, they're coming in, they're coming in basically from behind the island where there's going to be turbulent air. So that's the turbulent airflow. So that's not too great. So that's one reason why the island is usually on the port, on the starboard side. Uh, another theory I've heard is that the, the stick, right, um, aviators, pilots usually hold the stick, are usually right-handed. So they hold the stick in, the, in their right hand. And so therefore banking left in the aircraft is naturally easier because you're pushing on the stick with your right hand. You're pushing the stick over to the left side. It's easier to do with your right hand. Another thing I've heard is that um, in old, like, prop-driven aircraft, you know, like back in World War II, the torque of the engine makes the plane kind of naturally want to bank to the left. And so, the, therefore, you know, if they're taking off or if they're landing and they have, like, a problem and they need to, like, wave off or something, the island isn't there to obstruct them. So if in, the, in the event of, like, mechanical issue or whatever, the aircraft naturally wants to kind of go to the left and you have to compensate for that. So. And um, specifically for the Akagi and the Hiryu, being the only carriers with the, or, their islands on the port side, the reason for this is that according to Jonathan Parshall and Anthony Tolley in their book Shattered Sword, Japanese design studies in the mid-1930s experimented with moving the island from you know, to the port side of the ship. And this is, this is because it was away from the ship's stacks and the exhaust gases. The idea being that this would re therefore further reduce the turbulent airflow, airflow over the aft end of the flight deck. Yeah, that was the idea for why they put it on the port side, is to move it away from the ship's stacks. Now, in reality, this actually made the turbulent airflow worse, although it didn't really stop those carriers from you know, having, you know, quite eventful careers. Yeah. But that's basically why the Japanese did it for those two carriers. They were experimenting with airflow over the flight deck. Anyway, since we have captured this island, uh, let's say we're about good and we're about good to end off this video. Yep, our virus bot's just self-destructed. Just gonna wait for this surface vehicle to get back into bait. There it goes. Well, I think that's going to do it for now. So, yeah, one more island captured. I think we're going uh we're going further west in the next one.